From the time Vincent Lam was a young man, he wanted to write. His parents encouraged him to get a more reliable occupation, so he went to the University of Toronto and got a medical degree. Today he works as an emergency physician and he writes great books too. Lam is a superb doctor and superb writer who lives in the centre of the Canadian literary tribe. He won a Geller Prize for his short story collection, Bloodletting and Miraculous Cures. His first novel has just been released. It is called The Headmaster's Wager and it is my pleasure to welcome Vincent Lam to Studio 4 to tell us more. Thank you for having me. When I say it's your first novel, it took you a while to write it, apparently. Four years of tough slugging, and then you once said it started to write itself. Yes, that's right. Yeah, just at the end of four years, when I'd come very close to giving up on several occasions, it began to work. You know, for the first four years, I felt like I was dragging it around. And then the last year, sort of fifth year of work, mm. it was kind of like the novel pulled me forward. Interesting. And suddenly the characters helped me, the book itself helped me. If I had questions about what was going to happen in a scene, I could just ask the characters and they would tell me. And the idea began with the grandfather in your family, perhaps? True, true. Tell me the, about him. Well, the protagonist is inspired by my grandfather. And so my grandfather was the headmaster of an English school in Vietnam during the Vietnam War, a very prestigious English school. And he was also a gambler. He was also a womanizer, a man who only drank the best cognac, mm -hmm. and a man who enjoyed himself. So yes. he, he lived large. He was both very accomplished and yet could be very irresponsible. And so those are the characteristics that the main character in The Headmaster's Wager shares with my real-life grandfather. Uh, Percival. Percival, Percival Chen, yes. Chen, the mm -hmm. headmaster of the school. And I'm sure you used a lot of fiction to embellish, or did you really? Well, the, the things that happened to Percival Chen are fictional. Okay. And I, I really, really um, believe that the, the best way sometimes to tell a certain kind of truth is to use fictional events, because okay. it makes it possible to be free as a writer. Sure. And it's easier for us to absorb because it moves right along. You still yeah. learn about the history of the war and what was going on in Vietnam and uh, uh, the, uh, some of the cultural things like, well, tell me about that. Because uh, he was Chinese, yes. living in Vietnam in, is it Cholon? Yes, yes. Cholon. Who would say Cholon? Cholon, yeah. Cholon. There's sort of an and, uptick in there. Uh, okay, yeah. Cholon. He was living in Cholon in, like an expat. That's right. There was this place, um, Cholon, which was this Chinese sister city to Saigon and at one point they were separated by about six kilometers of railway and road of course mm -hmm. and now Saigon has grown and it's all become one city right but in that time they were these sort of um, separate enclaves and the Chinese lived a very Chinese life in their enclave they often spoke Chinese did business in Chinese and so that was the environment in which my grandfather Right, school. and do they feel a bit superior to the Vietnamese, or yes. like they were Absolutely. just a little up the scale? And well, you know, everyone felt superior to everyone. And of that's, course, that's the funny thing about ethnophobias, mm -hmm. right, mm -hmm. and about racism. That that I think um, different people can simultaneously feel superior to each other. Yes, and, and none of them are. None of them are. <laughs> that's the none other part. Are. But mm -hmm. um, looking from the outside, looking from the West, we sometimes forget how much that that was mm -hmm. and is part of the dynamic in Asia. Of and certainly course. in Vietnam at that time, you know, I think you, you could have found many Chinese people, not all, but many Chinese people who would have said, well, you know, we're better business people mm -hmm. than the Vietnamese. And uh, going back to China it would be a great thing. Yes, many felt that China was their home, despite the fact that they were living in Vietnam. China was the mother country to which they gravitated. Mm -hmm. Yes, and uh, to integrate with a Vietnamese, if you're male, to integrate with a Vietnamese female, not so good or okay? You know, everything is a question of degree. And mm -hmm. for instance, in my own family, there certainly was intermarriage. So Chinese married Vietnamese, and, mm -hmm. and, and many families uh, did that, and it was not necessarily a problem. But there definitely were families in which that would have been a problem, and in which there would have been an expectation that a young Chinese man would marry a young Chinese woman. Right, and some of that runs through this book. So the essence of the story is? The essence of the story is that 
the son of Percival Chen gets into trouble, he tries to impress his father with his Chineseness, although he, in fact, is born Vietnamese and speaks mm -hmm. Vietnamese fluently. Because of this demonstration, wherein he is trying to impress his father with his Chineseness, he gets in trouble with the authorities. He's arrested by the secret police, who are advised at that point in history by the CIA. And to be arrested by the mm -hmm. secret police in South Vietnam at that time was no laughing matter. I guess not. At any time, really, when the secret no. police arrest you, no matter where That's you are, right. but and at so, that yeah. time specifically. And Percival Chen mm -hmm. must try to do everything possible. He must try to risk everything to save his son. Yes, and he does risk a lot. We won't give yeah. it away. No. No, but he does risk a lot, and he's, as you suggest, a gambler. Mm. And a womanizer. True. There is a love interest in the book. Yes, there is yeah. that Jacqueline. Mm -hmm. She's was she would, would she be considered a lady of the night, uh, a call girl? Uh, you know the the categories at that time were were blurred, mm -hmm. right? So so a common joke that you might hear, for instance, in in a good class of Vietnamese society, right? In in educated classes, people might joke that, oh, well, it's unfortunate. I don't have a daughter who can go out and earn money from mm -hmm. the Americans. Aha. Uh -huh. You know, the because this, this phenomenon of, of, of prostitution during the war was very widespread and mm -hmm. very profitable. You know, so, um, so people whom you, you wouldn't think would exchange yes. sex for money um, would do that, and, and mm -hmm. that, that was part of many sorts of unusual businesses that took Of course, place and money somehow took the pressure off, in a way. Perhaps, for some people. Perhaps, uh, for, uh, took it off uh, the love angle, for sure. Well, you know, Wouldn't that's, you what, think? that's what Percival tries to tell himself. So that he, is. You know, he falls in love with mm -hmm. a woman who is not Chinese, whom he would not necessarily be prone to falling in love with, mm -hmm. and tells himself, well, he's paying her, so it's okay. So it's okay. It's not about love. That's what he tells himself. That's what he tells himself, and we won't give that part no, away no. either. No, we have to leave many cliffhangers. Of course you do. When you interview. write a novel, as you know, your last book, Miraculous Cures, you could talk about it because it was nonfiction. Yeah. Right? There were, were no great surprises, lots mm. of information. But when you write fiction, you know, well, it's jam-packed. We don't want to spoil the experience for the reader. No. Right? Yeah. No, and we won't. I promise. Uh, when did you know that writing was, I said you were young, but was it in school? Did somebody inspire you, or did you just know you wanted to write? It was really from being a reader, and mm -hmm. I was an avid, avid reader from the time I was a small child into my teenage years, and I really understood books as this kind of magical thing where it was possible for me to enter other worlds mm -hmm. and for worlds to appear in my imagination just as a result of the combination of 26 letters. And yeah. so I found that to be incredible mm. and, and simultaneously both totally intimate and totally public, you know, because it's a personal experience and yet the book is there for yes. anyone to see. For you know, sure. So and amazing. I bet you read Hemingway. I just have a feeling. You are correct. Really? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I read Hemingway very early, mm, very often. Because he certainly takes you away in that degree. Mm. Mm -hmm. I admire him, amongst many writers. And is there something you do in medicine as an emergency physician, and something you do when you're writing that is similar? Uh, you, you, in medicine, you have to listen to people's stories. Right. Well, I, I should say that my handwriting, both as a doctor and a writer, is terrible. <laughs> it's terrible. Good. You know, it so we have illegible. no idea. That's right. good. So That's only a I can start. Read it. And do you handwrite when you uh, uh, plot? I edit by hand. So you I do. Okay. I draft like this, mm -hmm. and then I edit. Mm -hmm. Like this. Mm -hmm. but both but medicine and, and books are about story. Sure. You know, they're about story. Of course. And a great doctor is about story. It's about, certainly, you have to have the skills. I'm not suggesting. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> you know, that you don't have the skills. But in an emergency room, especially, you've got the uh, intrigue and you have to solve the puzzle. That's right. And go quickly so you've got the suspense. That's right. You've got to, to grab onto the plot mm -hmm. and the story. So that you know what to do with it. You know, sure. anyone can read a textbook and learn it, but to figure out how to engage in a situation right. is what I do as a doctor, and to figure out how to engage in a situation is also what I do as a writer. Mm -hmm. And in your heart, when you were young, you wanted to be a writer, or did you want to be a doctor? I wanted to be a writer first. Mm. 
That was my first love. And medicine became a second true love. Okay. I do love medicine. And you love what about medicine? What I love is that people bring me these amazing situations. Mm -hmm. You know, nothing is predictable or routine in what I do as an emergency doctor. And people really give me the privilege of being involved in their stories and their situations. Yes. And that's a tremendous privilege and, and, mm. and really a huge both human and professional challenge. And, and I enjoy it a great deal. And did you consider an other side of medicine, uh, specializing in gastroenterology or <laughs> becoming an oncologist? Because they solve a lot of, you know, issues. They do. They do. And, you know, and, and I'm sure every specialty mm. in medicine deals with, um, deals with human narrative. But, but I think emergency medicine really grabbed me because there was so much narrative, so much human drama, and... And, you know, if your eyes yes. are open in emergency medicine, the entire world is both confronting you and making mm -hmm. you a special part of it. And the human factor. Oh, yeah. When you, yeah. When you see somebody terrified in, I had a giant brain aneurysm um, oh. six years ago, size of a plum in my frontal lobe. So I spent oh, a little goodness. time in emergency, as you can right. imagine. But they pulled out all the stops and saved my sorry neck, which is good. Good. <laughs> but you're yeah. ever grateful. As you know, I'm sure anybody who comes back to you, do they come back to you? Patients often, uh, they, yeah. you certainly go to your neurosurgeon. Sometimes people do, and sometimes people come up to me at readings mm -hmm. and say, oh yes, you took care of my, my finger or mm -hmm. my belly or... <laughs> right. And then I always, I'm a little bit worried when they say that, I say, did it turn out okay? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Well, now that you're a media darling of sorts, but I, weren't you on a cruise ship or something with Margaret Atwood? True. Yeah, I was working as a cruise ship doctor in the Arctic uh -huh. some years ago. And she wasn't sick necessarily, but somehow you connected. And she actually, and I've known Peggy for years. Yeah. yeah. I, I can call her Peggy. And she's not the kind that would say, oh, she's the kind who would endorse you as a young writer for mm. sure. But she wouldn't take much time to read what you're writing, I don't think. Well, it's funny. When, I mean, we spent two weeks together on a very small boat. Okay, right? So we helps. got to know each other. Mm -hmm. um, and I sheepishly asked her at one point if she would look at my stuff. And her reply was, well, you have to tell me what you want. Do you want me to tell you something nice or yes. do you want me to tell you the truth? Aha, uh -huh. that sounds exactly, of course she'd say that. And she told you the truth. Yes. And then you won the giller. True. Yeah, guilty as charged. Guilty as charged, that's so fabulous. This is a great book. Uh, one critic said it should be three books. It's so good, and it's so chock full of, of everything. And the, the research, meticulous. You, your first time in Vietnam was when? 2004? It was in 2004. Mm -hmm. I went twice as part of the research, and I read extensively over a number okay. of years. And the next the novel, the next Vincent Lamb? The next novel is Deep in My Heart, and I'm okay. keeping it secret for the time Okay, being. no working title. Was this the no. title of the Headmaster's Wager when you started this? No, there was another title called uh, Cholon Near Forgotten. Oh. And there were a couple of problems with that title. One is that people kept on calling it Colon. Oh, that, Near Forgotten. Be being that you're That's a doctor. A <laughs> yeah. And then I didn't want people um, Mm -hmm. You know, I didn't want people to necessarily forget the book. So I thought, I think we need yeah, a new title. The Headmaster's Wager. Great title, great cover. And uh, you'll be at the Vancouver International Writers Festival with Lyndon McIntyre, who's coming here. He's in his trilogy. That's He's right. got Why Men Lie. May the and 9th. The, May the 9th. You yeah. two will be together at 7.30 at the Vancouver Public Library. Free. So we hope people will come out. That'll be a fascinating night. Right. They will. No hockey in Vancouver. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Hawking gets this place into trouble, I've heard. <laughs> I, I yeah. hear tell. The headmaster's wager, Vincent Lamb, our guest, uh, Scotiabank Giller Prize, one of his.